Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by Indiana University Press. Their Life of the Past series is lavishly illustrated and meticulously documented to showcase the latest findings and most compelling interpretations in the ever-changing field of paleontology. Find their books at iupress.indiana.edu. This week, in our 220th episode, we have a bunch of dinosaur news, including a new sauropod dinosaur, another dinosaur that was found in amber, an update on the original Archaeopteryx find, some dinosaur shows, and we also have Dinosaur of the Day, Musaurus. What a week. It's exciting, (laughs) action-packed. But before we get into all of that, we want to thank some of our patrons who keep this podcast going for everybody to enjoy and keep us motivated to create this every week in perpetuity. (laughs) So this week we would like to thank Wyatt, the Georges family, John Heck, Janice, Ranger Chris from Dino for Hire, Ray, Oliver E., Andrew and Helena Webb, Callum, Ricky, William, Red Sox Rex, Jay, and Wouter from the Netherlands. And Wouter just joined, so thank you very much. Yeah, thanks everybody. As Garrett mentioned, this keeps us motivated to keep the show going every week, and we've been thinking up new ways to reward you because you are amazing. And so, yeah, keep an eye out on our Patreon page. And for those of you who haven't joined yet, not too late, you can join anytime at patreon.com slash I know Dino. And jumping into the news, our first article was recommended to us by both Shannon on Facebook and Jess Sendis on Discord. At least that's their Discord name. <laughs> yep. And that brings me to a good reminder that we have a Discord server And I like to post some images on there. So for example, this first article is about a new sauropod. So I will be posting some images around the time the episode comes out so that you can kind of look at it and see the dinosaur that we're talking about. Because a lot of other ways of posting things just don't feel as easy and interactive. I really like the Discord format because I can like post a picture and you can see it immediately and comment on it. And then I can post an update really easily. And it's a lot less pressure than a blog post. I don't feel like everything has to be perfect in it because it's going to be there forever because it's a little more temporary. So anyway, if you're interested in seeing pictures of these different dinosaurs that we're going to talk about, make sure to join the Discord because we'll have links to some of them and pictures of some of them directly in there. Yeah, and this one Garrett's about to talk about is a really weird one. It is super weird. So the article is written by Pablo Gallina and others and published in Scientific Reports. And it's a new sauropod, like I said. It's specifically a dicreosaurid, which is the group that includes a margosaurus. And a margosaurus, again, is that sauropod. And it's got the sort of dual sets of sails usually it's depicted kind of running down its back so it's vertebrae have these really tall neural spines that stick out up through the skin of its neck (laughs) into the air and then they're either covered in skin or keratin or something we don't really know why it has them it's really weird but it's amazing looking it's one of the coolest looking dinosaurs there's a couple of museums in europe that have them on display i don't think i've ever seen one in the u.s though we tend to focus on like the American sauropods like Diplodocus and Brontosaurus and things like that. I don't see a lot of Amargosaurus around here. It's also a little bit smaller, but it has those really cool spines. Anyway, <laughs> this one was found in Southwest Argentina. Its name is Bajatosaurus pronospinax. And Bajatosaurus is from Bajada, which is Spanish for downhill, but really it's because it was found in the Bajada, Colorado formation. So It's really named after the formation more than just being downhill. It's like downhill lizard is kind of a weak name, but yeah, it makes sense if it's in that formation. And then pronospinax comes from pronus, which is Latin for bent forward, and spinax, which is Greek for spine. So if you put that together, you get these spines that are curving forward. And that's a really good name for it because it has spines on its back that are curving forward. (laughs) Very descriptive. Exactly. So if you know a Margosaurus has spines that don't curve, they just stick out basically straight up out of its neck. This one, on the other hand, they like have a pretty dramatic curve, like almost 90 degrees by the end of the curve forward, which looks 
really, really strange. And in addition to those spines, they also found the jaw, including teeth, and most of the skull, and then two vertebrae, one of which has those really cool spines. The other vertebrae is sort of the link between the skull and the neck, so it doesn't have any spines because it's the bone that's known as the axis. It's sort of more of like a connective joint than anything that you could stick a big <laughs> spine <laughs> on. But the other one, the really impressive one that's basically the whole reason that this dinosaur is so interesting, is probably about the fifth from the head. So it's still not that large of a vertebrae overall, but the spines on it are massive. I think they said they're about four times as long as the vertebrae is long. Wow. So it's, yeah, they really stick out of there. There's no way that this could have been contained within the neck. Like there's no thickness of neck that's reasonable <laughs> that could have kept these neural spines of the vertebrae inside the neck. So they must have stuck out. Like a Margosaurus, the spines are bifurcated, meaning that they are two separate spines all the way from the base, which is, you know, still within the neck up to the top. So it's actually like a pair, almost like the old depictions of Stegosaurus, where they had the parallel plates running down the back. It sort mm -hmm. of has that look to it, except that it actually has it, <laughs> unlike Stegosaurus, where we now think they're more alternating. According to their analysis, Bahatosaurus's closest relatives are probably Lingwulong and Pilmatwea, but with such fragmentary remains, we're probably better off just saying that it's somewhere in Dicreosauridae because it's mostly based on just one vertebrae and like subtle differences. But you know, you can have some individual variation and things that kind of makes that tricky. It's about 140 million years old, which is about the same as Pilmatwea, and they're from the same formation. So that's not surprising. It's probably why they're dated the same. But like I said, some of those differences on the vertebrae and the shape of it, they think make it distinct from Pilmatwea. So they don't think that they're the same dinosaur. But who knows? The future, maybe this really cool named dinosaur might just get synonymized. Since it's 140 million years old too, that makes it about 10 million years older than a Margosaurus, in case you're wondering, because a Margosaurus is pretty well known. So spines are have been around for a while. Yeah, for sure. And the spines are especially strange because, like I said, they curve forward and they curve so far forward that even though the one that they found is the fifth vertebrae, so the fifth from the head, they might have almost reached the back of the head in terms of like the position forward. They wouldn't have curved downwards towards the head, but you know, like if you imagine it kind of like a parasol or something curving up, like it was going to shade the head. They're very thin though. So, I mean, unless they had skin attaching them sort of laterally, it wouldn't have actually provided any shade. That'd be kind of a cool thing though. Anyway, their main hypothesis is that the spines were covered in keratin sheaths. And they're basing this on previous work, which concluded that a Margosaurus had keratin sheaths on its spines. So no skin. That's what they're saying, yeah. But they did point out that on their specific spines, they weren't in good enough condition to really see what the interface with the air would have been like. Mm. So they can't really say that for sure. It's all just based on this Amargosaurus research that they think is close enough. And I, I don't really think that's settled even with Amargosaurus because usually I see that depicted with a connection in between the bones. Right. But one of the reasons they say that it might have had keratin sheaths is that they think the keratin might have made it stronger and then less likely to break Whereas if it was just connected with skin, these are really thin pieces of bone and really long too. So you could see how if it was just covered in skin, then it could be pretty easy to snap off if you bumped your head on something basically, <laughs> which would be awful. I wonder what the point of the spines were then. Yeah, it's really strange. They had a few different hypotheses about what they could have been used for. They said maybe they could have been used for defense, which I think is pretty dicey. Since it's so thin? Yeah, they're very thin. Unless the keratin sheath is so thick. Exactly. That's, I think, the only way that that's possible. I don't know. It doesn't seem like it'd be strong enough to be very useful in defense. The only way that it might be useful, though, is that if the keratin makes them look a lot larger, then it's a defensive mechanism in the same way that like a cobra's puffing out of its neck skin <laughs> to look more intimidating is a defense mechanism. It's more, it could be more of an appearance thing right. than like an actual physical like bludgeoning weapon. <laughs> 
as usual. They also said it could have been used for sexual attraction, which isn't surprising because that's one of the main uses for horns is just like a big display structure. Like, look how amazing I am. I got these big old horns. I'm really good at finding food so I can grow these big horns. You should mate with me. <laughs> <laughs> Weirdly, though, they also said that it could have been used for temperature regulation. And it doesn't seem like horns are much of a temperature regulation kind of structure. No, but that same hypothesis has been proposed for stegosaurus plates. Yeah, it, it's a strange one, the temperature regulation one. It seems like there's better ways to do this. But then again, it could be a combination of things. So maybe they grew them originally for defense, for example, to look bigger because maybe there were bigger, badder predators around or something and they needed to look tougher. And then that also led into a sort of sexual selection thing because the ones that weren't getting eaten and look tougher are more attractive. And then maybe on top of that, it helps them regulate some temperature. So they just took advantage of all these things. It's not uncommon for like a single structure to serve multiple purposes. Yeah. I just had an image in my head of that land before time scene where I think it's Littlefoot, Ducky, Spike, and Petrie fell into a tar pit and they get out, but they got out by climbing on top of each other. And so they have these tar and sticks sticking out. Oh, yeah. And then they scare Sarah because they look so big and scary and like a much bigger animal. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> Because a lot of it is just that first instinct of how big is this compared to me? I better get away from it. Yeah. Plus they had the sticks coming out that reminded me of the spines. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. The other interesting thing about, especially if they were keratin covered, it makes the spines look much bigger in addition to just how massive that these <laughs> bone spines are coming out of the back. Based on the reconstructions that they showed, the keratin covering almost doubled the length of the exposed spines because there's the portion of the spine that's still in the neck. You know, it has to reach the skin before you can actually see it. And then that additional part that sticks out, they added like another almost 50% to that piece. So you could see how that would really improve their chances at finding a mate if that was sort of a selection criteria because keratin is probably easier to add on top than it is to grow the bone that much bigger. They made a really awesome replica of Bahatosaurus too. They have one of sort of the fossil, so the, the kind of thing you're used to seeing in museums where it's just the bones. But then they also made a sculpture replica so you can really see what it might have looked like in real life. And that one, one thing I really like about it is they have these coloration patterns on the spines and they colored it differently, sort of where the bone runs out and then where it's just keratin continuing on. So you can kind of get a feel for just how much the keratin impacts the overall appearance of the dinosaur. It's really neat. They sort of recreated from maybe about the 10th vertebrae up through the head. And so, yeah, they're, and they're kind of curling down. And the way that they textured that keratin sheath is also really cool. It sort of looks like the ring texture that you see on an antelope horn, if you know what I'm talking about, like a whole series of rings, like it was built. Oh, yeah. Like ridges along the horn. It also kind of reminds me of rebar, that sort of texture to it. Mm -hmm. That was the texture that they gave to the Bahatosaurus spines. That's fun. Yeah, it looks pretty tough. In addition to that spine, that's really cool. I actually think that the skull maybe even cooler because it's the most complete skull we've ever found for a dicreosaurid. So it really gave us a lot of information about sort of maybe potentially their feeding habits and things like that. They found that its eyes are near the top of its skull, which possibly indicates that it had its head facing down to eat low plants. And it had teeth that were a lot like a diplodocus. And the overall skull shape too reminds me a lot of a diplodocus, which isn't too surprising because we've previously thought that dicreosaurids are closely related to diplodocus. And so we call them diplodocoids, sort of the larger diplodocid-ish <laughs> group of dinosaurs. So I think the previous recreations of a margosaurus skull were pretty close because they base, it looks like they based them on diplodocus by my eye. So pretty cool. I hope we find more of this guy. I'm a little bit curious if the spines actually did curve as far forward as this 
find makes them look because there's a possibility that that's a preservation issue oh, and right. it got bent during fossilization and it could be that this whole bent spine thing is blown way out of proportion because we only found one so you can't like compare a whole series of them and say oh well it's unlikely that all of them would bend in the same way at the same angle and stuff but when you only find one it's like that could just be a preservation thing At the very least it would feel weird to have a bunch of bent spines <laughs> Yeah, it seems really strange. And on top of that, it's like you couldn't really do a backward bend like you're doing the limbo or something because it looks like its spines would have run into each other. It looks like it could only kind of bend forward or flat. So I don't know. <laughs> Need more fossils. Yeah. Up next, we have our new amber find. And this one was also sent to us from Jess Sendis on Discord. And this one was published in Nature Scientific Reports. Also, just like the last story. And it was written by Lita Shing and others. And that's not surprising because they're the lead author on, I think, all of these <laughs> amber vines. Mm -hmm. So, just a quick recap we've got a whole bunch of really awesome amber that's been coming out of Myanmar. And it's all from the same mine, basically, which is about 99 million years old. So far in episode 84, we talked about two wings that were found in amber. In episode 108, we talked about a tail that was found in amber. And then in 135, we talked about half of a baby bird, which was found in amber too. So all really awesome finds. Oh, isn't this part of the collection? They found a bunch of amber pieces. And then over the years, they were going to be publishing about them. Yeah, they, I believe that in one of the early studies, I said that they found between 10 and 12 pieces total that they'd be publishing over the coming years. I couldn't find that exact source. I wonder if they like edited it out <laughs> after realizing they didn't want to share that. I don't know. But this would be the fifth if that's the case. So maybe we're about halfway through this set. But then I've also heard that they go back or they potentially might go back periodically and sort of deal with the people who sell these fines. And they probably pay more than people might be willing to pay if it's just like a random interesting looking bone type of thing. So maybe they have found even more since then. I hope so. What they found specifically in this piece was a full foot and then a little bit of wing feathers. The foot is really cool. So the claws on the foot are beautiful. The toes are curled up kind of like they're grasping something. So you know what bird feet look like when they're about to grab something. Oh, yeah. It's relatively small because it's from an enantiornithine bird. I think that's basically what all of these have been from. But when you look at it like blown up, the claws look like any other sort of dinosaur claws, especially because enantiornithines had, you know, pretty big claws and pretty big teeth and all that kind of stuff <laughs> compared to modern birds and things. Unfortunately, the end of one of its claws and most of the wing was polished away. And that's because basically the reason that these people dig out amber out of the ground is to sell it as jewelry. I mean, that's the real economic value of amber most of the time. They don't do it just hoping to find a dinosaur <laughs> piece in one in a million pieces. They do it to polish it down and sell it as jewelry. So I think a lot of times they start polishing it, getting it ready as like a nice piece of jewelry. And then they go, oops, <laughs> there's something inside this I should stop polishing. So... That has happened in a couple of the previous cases as well, and it looks like it happened here too. It's unfortunate, but we probably would never find this stuff if people weren't digging it out for jewelry in the first place. So in addition to the sort of position of the foot, which looks really cool, it also had just amazing preservation. They found lots of different types of feathers, and they can see a lot of details of the skin itself because unlike when something fossilizes in rock and it's sort of subject to a lot of oxidation and other sort of decay processes, when it's trapped in amber, it's like sealing it in resin or something. It basically locks it in time a lot better than it does when it's just being fossilized normally. The top of the foot is covered in what are called contour feathers. And by top, I mean kind of up closer to the leg. Contour feathers aren't for flight. They're more for insulation or display. I think of it as kind of like the underside of a bird or maybe the back of the bird where it has feathers, but they're not being used really like the wing feathers are for like flapping and aerodynamics and things like that. They might help a little bit with aerodynamics because of giving them a nice contour. That's the name. <laughs> there are also unfeathered scutes on the underside of the foot. 
and on parts of the toes and some other spots. And, you know, you know what scutes are. They're like ankylosaurs, little bumps, basically. They make the feet a little bit tougher. It's good to have some scutes there. So it gives it the most dinosaur look. It does. And you can see that on modern birds too. If you look at like a chicken foot or something, you'll see these little scute-like things. Yeah. Or that cassowary foot picture that was going around. Oh, I didn't see that one. Yeah, it was giant. and Oh, next to somebody's hand for scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> With the huge claws and yeah, like the big bumps on them for sure. And cassowaries are considered relatively close relatives to dinosaurs compared to at least other modern birds too. They also found some smaller scutes that they call scutelle. <laughs> that's cute. <laughs> yeah. And then they have scutelle scale filaments they call them, or SSFs that were on the toes. And the SSFs look like hairs, but they might be related to other proto feathers. So this is one of the most important things for a paleontologist in the find, because it might help us figure out how these SSFs are related to the evolution of feathers. Because at 99 million years ago, we're sort of in that evolution of feather time frame. So if we can compare things really closely, that'll help. And that actually is why it's so helpful, too, that there's part of the wing still in the amber. They think that maybe originally there was a lot more of the wing and more of the animal in the amber, but then it kind of got removed for the jewelryfication. <laughs> but it still has what they call overlapping primaries of the right wing. And primaries are those feathers that are at the end of the wing, and they're really the most important ones for flight. So if we can compare these flight feathers to these SSFs and contour feathers and other feathers around the bird, it really gives us a better idea of what kind of combination of feathers they had and possibly looking at sort of relationships in evolution of feathers. It's pretty awesome. And just one final <laughs> quote I want to pull out of the article it talks about like how this bird might have ended up in amber. Oh, no. They say, quote, these body parts were likely dismembered, entering the resin due to predatory or scavenging behavior by a larger animal, end quote. Ooh. Yeah. What a way to go. Yeah, it's not great. <laughs> it did look like the end of the foot was a little bit broken off. So like <laughs> the rest of the body might have been. No one wants to eat eaten. the foot. No. <laughs> well, some people might. But I don't. Yeah. Oh, well, okay. No animals back then, maybe. Well, no, I take that back. They probably eat whatever they can get. <laughs> yeah. They have big claws on it. It's not the most appetizing thing. <laughs> yeah. Not enough meat. Yep. It's a scientific reports kind of day. Because we've got one more. <laughs> this one was a new paper by Tams K and others. And it's about the 1862 fossil feather from the Solnholfen quarries that represented the holotype for Archaeopteryx. It was the first fossil feather found. Until it was redefined later as a different dinosaur, the holotype. It's got a neotype now. Oh, true, true. But this is about that original fossil feather. The gist is that they hypothesize this fossil feather is actually an isolated feather of a different unknown feather dinosaur that was from the same time and place and is not at all Archaeopteryx. Which, lots of changes happening to Archaeopteryx. Yeah. So, some background. This fossil feather, it's different from other Archaeopteryx fossils that were found later. It's dark in color and, quote, preserves as a film of carbon or manganese dioxide, end quote. There's been debate over this, quote unquote, missing quill for the fossil. So, according to the paper, quote, the originally reported calamus, which is the quill, is today invisible in the fossil, end quote. And the quill was actually described and drawn in 1862, but appears to be missing today. And this could be because of damage or the way the slab has been handled. And also it's been a while since 1862. Yeah. So there's theories on whether this fossil feather represents a primary, secondary, or covert feather, which is a feather that covers other feathers. So for the study, the team used Laser Stimulated Fluorescence, or LSF. Everybody loves the acronyms. Which means they used a high-power laser to see geochemical differences in the fossil and the slab of rock that it's in. And they found a geochemical halo of the original quill that matches the 1862 description. So it did exist. <laughs> and Archaeopteryx feathers, luckily, they're fairly similar to modern bird feathers. 
So that allowed for, I like this quote, cautious comparisons with living taxa. It's a good way to do it. So the team compared this fossil feather with other Archaeopteryx fossils and modern bird feathers. That's how they found that the isolated fossil feather is not an Archaeopteryx tail feather or primary or secondary feather. And this dark film preservation is different from other known specimens, so the fossil feather is different from the known Archaeopteryx skeletons, though not all feathers of Archaeopteryx are known. Interesting. It makes it especially strange that that was the original holotype. Yeah. And now we're saying like the holotype isn't Archaeopteryx. Right. Good thing there's a neotype. Yeah, because otherwise it's like, how can it not be itself? Yep. (laughs) Yeah, but I guess since we defined a neotype and it's all over the literature with these other skeletons, Mm -hmm. that it's like, well, yeah, that's not really Archaeopteryx anymore. That's just some feather that was found near (laughs) an Archaeopteryx. (laughs) You could probably name that unknown dinosaur since Archaeopteryx was named off that fossil feather. Oh, man, you really shouldn't, though. (laughs) It's pretty undiagnostic. Yeah, we have come a long way since the 1860s. Yeah, most of the time, every once in a while, though, we name something and it's like, oh, man, that is not a good good enough fossil to name a new species on. <laughs> <laughs> in a different part of the world, the I think it's the Mifune Dinosaur Museum in Kumamoto Prefecture in Japan, but the article was translated and it translated to a few different names. But Oh, interesting. As far as I could tell, the Mifune <laughs> Museum has possibly the oldest dinosaur fossil found in Japan on display. They call it the ribs of, quote-unquote, beast legs. It's a carnivorous dinosaur that lived about 130 million years ago. And this dinosaur was probably about 33 feet, 10 meters long. And it was a former geology and paleontology teacher, Koji Murakami, who found the fossil back in October 2014. Nice. Yeah, that's a pretty cool museum. It's really hard to get to, Mm -hmm. but it's pretty cool. (laughs) They've packed it full of stuff to see. They did, yeah. Next, thanks to Chris for sharing this one with us. So on May 30th, there will be a dinosaur event called Teach Rex in Liverpool in the UK. And people can learn about evolution, interact with animatronic dinosaurs. Plus there will be, they said, a dinosaur disco. Didn't really get much description on that, but you can guess. (laughs) Teach Rex is run by two part-time teachers, Joe Parsonage and Sam Bryan. So pretty cool. Also found out about something interesting in Arizona. There used to be this roadside attraction known as Bedrock City near the Grand Canyon. And it was this six acre theme park dedicated to the Flintstones. (laughs) And you could take photos with Fred Wilma and others, drive through a volcano and slide down the tail of a brontosaurus. Just like, yeah, just like in that opening scene of the theme song. After 43 years, though, the park shut down and the new owner, Troy Morris, who's a falconer, plans to open the park And it can be a place for people to see hawks, eagles, and other birds of prey. And he's going to call it Raptor Ranch. (laughs) (laughs) He is, though, keeping the brontosaurus slide. So you don't miss out. Nice. So it's just gone from sort of fictionalized non-avian dinosaurs. And now it's like a avian dinosaur thing. So it's still dinosaur related. (laughs) Exactly. I like that name, Raptor Ranch. Yeah, that's cool. So speaking of birds, there's a new website that's making bird bones in museums more accessible for if you're teaching or doing research, and it's called Fauna Toolkit Bird Bones. It shows 3D bird bones. Right now, they have 159 bones from 28 species, and they're planning on adding more. You could go on forever. Was it like 10,000 species of birds? <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> a lot of them, this first round are from New Zealand. So The idea is it's going to be helpful in identifying bird bones, maybe even species. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot easier to get a full collection of bird bones than it is to get non-avian dinosaur bones because you usually find the whole animal. (laughs) Yeah. And then that's obviously a lot easier to check if you found something unique too. Yes. But with birds, part of the thing is we can see so much more of the animal that we have subspecies and species that if you look at the skeleton alone, you would never see a difference because it's like coloration patterns and behavioral differences and things like that. Mm, so, so it's possible that was the case with dinosaurs. Yeah. And they might not need all 10,000 in terms of getting a full collection of bird bones. Oh, true. They might only need like 1,000 and basically have a nearly exhausted collection <laughs> of skeletons. I'm sure there's species that haven't even been discovered yet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They find new ones periodically. In Glasgow, Scotland, there's some cool dinosaurs on display. 
Currently, Dippy's there. And then Trix is one of the best preserved T-Rex skeletons. Is going to be on display at Kelvin Hall starting April 18th to July 31st. And then Dippy's there until May 6th. So there's a good overlap period. The Trix T-Rex is 39 feet long, weighs about five tons. And she's on tour while they're building a new building in her museum in Leiden in the Netherlands. Oh, yeah. So this is the next stop for Trix. Mm -hmm. We've been doing periodic updates along the way. (laughs) Yep. That was a good crossover there in Glasgow for a couple months. Yeah, they managed to snag Dippy and Trix. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Trix is a little more exciting, in my opinion. Oh, because Trix is real? Yeah, plus new. (laughs) (laughs) I see. (laughs) Well, I mean, if you're really into dinosaurs and you live in Britain, you've probably seen Dippy. True, true. But Trix is like... Just got dug out of the earth and then shipped across the ocean a couple Mm -hmm. of years ago. That's true. (laughs) Last, there's a new play in the UK about Gideon Mantell called Dinomania. So Mantell found the first known iguanodon tooth in 1822, and he realized it belonged to a previously unknown animal. because Dinosaurs weren't a thing yet. But his work was eclipsed by Richard Owen, who was really well known and helped establish the Natural History Museum in London. Lauren Mooney, who co-wrote the play, said that Owen wanted to prove dinosaurs were God's monsters. This is around the time that Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species came out in 1859, so there was a lot of debate. And Owen worked on discrediting Mantell's research and in trying to classify dinosaurs as God's monsters, named them Dinosaur to describe them, you know, terrible lizard. And Lauren said that Owen took most of the credit for dinosaurs. So the play will be at the New Diorama Theater in London from February 19th to March 23rd. Awesome. Yeah. I want to know if anybody goes and sees that, tell us how it is. I wish we could see it. It's like a mini Bone Wars. A little bit, yeah. (laughs) The original Bone Wars. I think we might have talked about that before. Maybe there was another rivalry back then too. I think Richard Owen had a lot of rivals. He did, yeah. Apparently he wasn't really a great person to hang out with. (laughs) But that's interesting. I always forget that the Charles Darwin stuff came out around the same time. Yeah. Yeah, well, like Thomas Huxley, too, was talking about Archaeopteryx and, you know, the evolution of dinosaurs into birds potentially way back in the 1860s. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it makes sense, especially back then. Not everybody was on board with evolution. Before we get into our dinosaur of the day, we have a word from our sponsor, Indiana University Press. As Garrett mentioned at the beginning of the show, they have a Life of the Past series that is really well illustrated and documents the latest findings, most compelling interpretations in paleontology. So I want to talk about where dinosaurs roamed, and we mentioned this one before, but it's very good. And also, it's about dinosaurs. <laughs> Some of these are tangentially related to dinosaurs. This one is focused on dinosaurs. The description reads, The Grand Staircase region, located in southern Utah, is highly regarded as one of the best places in the world to study the period near the end of the Age of Dinosaurs, a time called the Late Cretaceous. In a relatively short period, geologically speaking, of about 25 million years, southern Utah was at times covered with an ocean teeming with life, swampy shorelines, and massive rivers draining a huge mountain range in the west. This diversity of plant and animal life has led to incredible fossil discoveries in the late Cretaceous rocks that have become a critical piece in a puzzle that stretches from Alaska to Mexico. So if you're interested at all in North American dinosaurs, especially in southern Utah, you've got like T-Rex and the well-known ones, then this book is for you. It's written by Krista Sadler, and it gives you some information basically on the history of life. And if you want to purchase this book, then go to iupress.indiana.edu. And now onto our dinosaur of the day, Musaurus, which was a request from Pat and Dinosaur 4602. And this is also a dinosaur that appears in the Jurassic World, Jurassic Park world. Universe. (laughs) Universe. Thank you. (laughs) Musaurus was a sauropodomorph that lived in the late Triassic in what is now southern Argentina in the El Tranquilo Formation. The name means mouse lizard. It was found in the 1970s by Jose Bonaparte and a team. They found eggs and hatchlings and then described in 1979 by Jose Bonaparte and Martin Vince. They found small juveniles and infant skeletons at first that were about mouse-sized. Makes sense with the name. They found seven juveniles and a couple eggs. The nest was about 215 million years old. 
the juveniles were between 7.8 to 14 and a half inches or 20 to 37 meters long. And now some adult specimens have been found, one subadult and three adults. The adult specimens were described in 2013. Some specimens were described in 1980, but at the time were classified as Plesiosaurus. Musaurus could grow up to 10 feet or 3 meters long and weighed up to 150 pounds or 70 kilograms, so much bigger than a mouse. <laughs> Juveniles had shorter snouts, larger nasal bones, and larger eye sockets than adults, which is pretty common. And the eggs had thin shells. Musaurus had long forelimbs, so it probably was quadrupedal, meaning it walked on four legs. And since some hatchlings were near the nest with the eggs, that may indicate some parental care. Musaurus may have been herbivorous, but it may have also eaten insects. The type species is Musaurus patagonicus. Musaurus was mentioned in the Lost World novel by Michael Crichton. The character Richard Levine picks up a small Musaurus on Isla Sorna early on in the book. And it's also in the comic series Jurassic Park Redemption. Interesting. I don't remember that in The Lost World, but it sounds like it wasn't really a main Very small character. Part, although it holds true to its name in the book. Being mouse-like? Yeah. <laughs> and our fun fact of the day is that gizzards present a problem for modern dinosaurs, also known as birds, when they eat something sharp. So it makes me wonder how, you know, ancient dinosaurs might have dealt with this kind of thing. So we've all seen shark stomachs with all sorts of crazy and often sharp objects in them. And apparently their intestines are pretty good at handling these sharp objects. So I guess they can kind of move away from sharp objects a little bit. I mean, it's not too surprising like that it might react and sort of shrink away a little bit. And supposedly human intestines do this too. I couldn't find a great source for this. Mostly what you find when you start searching for like eating sharp objects is a bunch of recommendations to go to the doctor, don't do it, be careful, all sorts of things like that, which is definitely true. Don't eat something sharp and rely on this. You should go to the doctor if that happens. But apparently our intestines handle it better than a lot of modern birds do. So birds can't really just rely on their intestines avoiding sharp things because their intestines actually do the digesting and like the chewing, <laughs> so to speak. Multi-purpose. Yeah, they don't have teeth, so they rely on their gizzard to grind up food. And the gizzard is basically just a bulge of the GI tract that's really strong and it kind of squeezes in and out. Usually there's some stones in there to help with grinding. And so if there's something sharp in there, and it's like squeezing really tight, it'll poke right through there. And apparently this happens all the time with chickens. Chickens have been killed by accidentally eating pieces of glass, which usually pass through human digestive tracts without a problem. But again, don't do that. Go to the doctor if you swallow a piece of broken glass. <laughs> yeah. Also, poor chickens. Yeah. Yeah, they're not the most well-evolved for survival animals. That's partly our fault. But it really makes me wonder just how T-Rex digestive system worked with all those sharp pieces of bone. And we don't know for sure that they had gizzards, although usually people assume that they did have gizzards because they're semi-closely related to modern birds. So maybe their gizzards were extremely thick and had durable walls, like on the show T-Rex Autopsy, where mm -hmm. they cut open the T-Rex and then they pulled out this big gizzard and they're like, look at the size of this thing. <laughs> it's pretty entertaining. But the bearded vulture that eats mostly bone. So there's this vulture, you might've seen it in like nature documentaries or something. They basically eat bone because most animals can't eat bone. So if you're a specialist for bone, it's not that hard to find a meal because you can just kind of soar around like vultures do, find some bone. I think they actually break them if I'm not mistaken. That's very T-Rexy. Yeah, a little bit. I don't, they wouldn't break it with their mouth. I don't know oh, exactly how they would do it, but yeah, they swallow large chunks of bone. But interestingly, these bearded vultures do not have gizzards in their GI tract at all. They just have a really high acid content in their stomach, and it can dissolve bone within 24 hours. So that might be how T-Rex dealt with it. Yeah. And I think that's how sort of hyenas deal with it too, because they like fully digest the bone too, which apparently can like turn their poop white. All the calcium. Yeah, exactly. It's crazy. So it makes me wonder exactly how T-Rex was dealing with all this bone. I think we've found bone pieces, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere amongst a T-Rex remains, like in the coprolite or stomach contents or something like that. Yeah, I think in the coprolite, and that's how they became known as bone crunchers. Yeah. 
but it's hard to say exactly how they were dealing with like these sharp pieces of bone. It'd be cool if we could find like a fossilized GI tract of a dinosaur though somehow or like one that's trapped in amber maybe and you could see like the full thing with like the crop and the gizzard and like all the different pieces that never fossilize. It'd be great. It would be. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episodes. Also, keep in touch with us via Patreon at patreon.com slash inodino. Or on Discord, which you get access to if you join the Patreon. Exactly. We're also on social media, but really just come talk to us on Discord. Thanks again for listening, and until next time. Good day.